A key area for Britain was Gibraltar. Strategically placed, it resembled any British garrison town with all its trappings, pomp and ceremony. Spanish police and British intelligence forces were both aware that the IRA had Gibraltar under surveillance and a decision was taken at the highest levels of the British government to carry out a shoot-to-kill operation. On the 6th of March 1988, the three unarmed IRA volunteers entered Gibraltar through the only border control point. At any given stage, the British forces could have arrested Mairead Farrell, Dan McCann and Sean Savage. Instead, they chose to lure the volunteers into the pre-designated killing zone. As the three set out to cross the border and return to Spain, Britain's murderous plan came into operation. While Dan and Maria had passed the petrol station, a police siren sounded. Sean Savage was some distance behind them. Within minutes, all three lay dead. Suddenly I heard two shots. There were about two shots. So I was just looking from where that came from. And all of a sudden I saw the woman and, you know, the couple on the floor. I looked out of the window and all of a sudden I saw a car, police car. It stops. All of a sudden, the doors were open, all of them, the four of them, and three men came out dressed in jeans and jackets, jumped over the intersection barrier in the road, guns in hand, and they just went and shot these people, that's all. They didn't say anything, they didn't scream, they didn't shout, they didn't do anything. These people were turning their heads back to see what was happening, and um, when they saw these men had the guns in their hand, they just put their hands up. Uh, it looked like uh, the, man, the man was protecting the girl because he stood in front of her, but um, there was no chance. I mean, they, they uh, went to the floor immediately. They, they dropped. Outside the petrol station, I saw a man who I, I'm fairly sure was wearing a, a bright yellow short-sleeved shirt, standing with both hands outstretched, holding a gun like this, and firing very rapidly into another man with blonde hair, wearing a white shirt, who was falling backward with his hands like this, and falling back almost in slow motion. He went right down, and the firing continued. He was still being shot at as he went down. I should say they were from a distance of about four feet, and that the firing was continuous. In other words, it's probably as fast as it, as it, as it is possible to fire, um, a continuous fire. Let's put it this way, I, I think in, with one step he could have actually touched the person he was shooting. He bent down and um, with the two hands he got his gun like that and went on shooting at them. I mean, it wasn't a question of just, just you know, putting, a few, putting, putting one or two shots into him just to stop him. I mean, it, this was, it seemed to me, a, a deliberate uh, shooting to kill. No question. There was no exchange of words on either side, no warning. Nothing said, no screams, nothing, just the shots. And I heard the first shot. It was then when I looked back and saw the other man that was running fall back as the other man continued shooting at him. And he was bouncing on the floor when, I, when the other man continued shooting at him about three or four shots more. And I thought he was dead. A few seconds later, we then heard um, a voice, a very uh, strong, authoritative voice, saying, police, stand back. And this was just outside the park itself. We obviously then just grabbed the children, put them on the floor, some people behind benches, others behind the seats. And a few shots followed shortly after that. And the next thing we saw was a chap on the floor with a bullet hole in his face. The man on the ground was lying on his back. The man standing over this man had his foot on the man's chest. I could see that he also had a gun in his hand. I then saw the gunman point his gun deliberately at the man that was lying on the floor and fire two or three times into him at point-blank range. I was horrified by what I saw. 
The state-sponsored media immediately launched into a familiar refrain. Good evening. Police in Gibraltar have shot dead three suspected Irish terrorists. They've also defused a car bomb in what's believed to be a combined operation with British troops in the colony and special branch police officers from Britain. The news from ITM. Suspected IRA terrorists shot dead in Gibraltar. Good evening. British soldiers in Gibraltar have shot dead three suspected IRA terrorists. It's believed the two men and a woman were on a bombing mission in the British colony. Later, a car bomb was found near the governor's residence. It's thought the target was a British army parade. The bomb was destroyed with a controlled explosion. Jeremy Hands at ITN reports. The gang were in the process of making their way back to the border when they were intercepted by the police backed up by the British Army. A fierce gun battle broke out around a petrol station at Winston Churchill Avenue during which the three terrorists were killed. The security forces then returned to the car bomb which was dealt with by a controlled explosion. But the day after the killings, the story suddenly changed. The British were forced to admit that there was no bomb at all and grudgingly acknowledged that the three volunteers had been unarmed when they were shot dead. The Foreign Secretary, Sir Geoffrey Howell, has revealed that there was no bomb in the car left by the three IRA terrorists shot dead in Gibraltar. He also told the House of Commons that they weren't carrying guns. Daily Express, race to find IRA car bomb, find the real bomb, real uh, bomb car as the star, Find the bomb, the sun, the Daily Mirror says that Evelyn Glen Holmes in particular is being sought after the incident. The Morning Star is on its own in talking about cold-blooded killings. A member of Sinn Féin and a relative of one of those killed have been to Gibraltar to arrange for the bodies to be brought home. Mairead Farrell's brother Terry was acting for all three sets of relatives and he was accompanied by Joe Austin, a leading member of Sinn Féin. When they drove across the border from Spain, their hire car was thoroughly searched and they were told to leave their vehicle at the frontier. They were escorted to another vehicle accompanied by a member of the coroner's staff and police officers. After passing the scene of the shootings, they arrived at the Royal Naval Hospital where the three bodies were lying. After formally identifying the three and talking to the local undertaker, they were escorted back to the Spanish border. They were in the colony for little more than an hour. There is an expectation of, of a very big turnout, uh, possibly in Dublin as well, well as Belfast, when the bodies are returned. Is that what you expect? Well, I think the circumstances of the shooting, I think that the, the individuals who were shot, who are very popular in their own circle and, and wider, I think that they, they will uh, attract large numbers of people. The coroner in Gibraltar has said that he intends to hold a full inquest in public, possibly even calling the soldiers to give evidence. Would you expect all the facts to come out at the inquest? Well, I have no, no indication there are no experience of, of coroner's courts here. Uh, my experience of them in Ireland is that they're less than satisfactory. The plane hired to carry the bodies home flew into Gibraltar on Monday. After landing, the job of servicing and loading the aircraft had to be carried out by the RAF. Gibraltar's civilian airport workers refused to refuel the plane or to handle the coffins. The bodies of the three members of the IRA shot dead in Gibraltar last Sunday have arrived in Dublin. This afternoon, civilian workers at Gibraltar Airport refused to refuel the aircraft or to load the coffins as a protest against terrorism. The RAF were called in to carry out the operation in their place. Meanwhile, in Dublin and on the road to Belfast, a big security operation has been in progress for much of the day.